Um, I want to start by saying I've had the privilege of sitting down with Jennifer Dulski on two occasions to, to interview her for Eclipse. So when you see a lot of interesting material here today, you should check into her Eclipse interviews, which are really quite lovely. Um, this occasion today was made possible by Sam Seltzer, who um, was a Cornellian. He's year 48. And he's worked for all these years, 30 years uh, or more, um, to develop programs in entrepreneurship. He's probably one of the leading founders of the entrepreneurship program at Cornell. And part of that was the, the establishment of the Moses and Lulu Seltzer Fund. And for that purpose, um, he honored his parents by making it possible for us to bring people to campus. And so I'm so delighted that he will be very delighted as well. I'm sorry he couldn't join us today. Uh, Jennifer Dulski is somebody who started her profession in the sort of nonprofit education world, got interested in tech, she'll talk a little bit about that, went to Yahoo, uh, rose to leadership at Yahoo, and then left to be a co-founder in a firm called DealMap, which eventually got out, bought out by Google. And when I first interviewed her last year, at the end of the interview, the camera was off, she said to me, I, I'm going to talk to you soon because a big change is coming for me. I'm going to be moving in a direction that's really important. And that move was for her to become the COO and president, is that right? President and CEO, COO of um, change.org, which is what she'll be talking a little bit about at the beginning. But I also asked her to share some of her wisdom and lessons from her experience. So let's give a warm welcome to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. And I also am going to be happy to take questions during the talk, because it might run most of the time. So if you have a question while I'm talking, feel free to raise a hand, and I will take those questions. And as, do you go by Professor Streeter in this room? As Professor Streeter mentioned, there'll be a couple sections to the talk. The first will be a little bit about change.org, tell you a little bit about the company and what we do. And then I'll talk a little bit more about my life and the advice that I have uh, that I think might be useful to you based on lots of things I've done right and lots of things I've done wrong. So change.org, we are the world's largest platform for social change. We empower people everywhere to create the change they want to see. So we have now 45 million users in every country in the world, starting petitions, winning petitions, for us, we measure victories. Those are when, not just how many signatures we get on a petition, but actually when the decision maker that petition is targeting does the thing that the petition is requesting, that's a victory. And we've now had 15 million people participate in victory on our platform. We also are a company, which surprises some people. I think the .org gets a little confusing. For people, we are what's called a registered B Corp, which is a company for social good. So we generate revenue, we have a business model, and our goal is to be financially self-sustaining and to maximize for impact rather than maximizing for profit. We have petitions on the site on every issue you can imagine. They are things like Katie Butler, who was bullied in her school, and when the movie Bully came out, she decided she, that everybody needed to see it. It had an R rating, so she convinced them to change it to PG-13, so the kids who really needed to see the movie could see it. Uh, this is Sarah Kavanaugh, a 15-year-old, who was able to convince Gatorade to take out brominated vegetable oil, which is an ingredient they use to make it brighter. It turns out it's also a flame retardant that had been already banned in Japan and Europe, but our FDA hadn't yet banned it. So. She started a petition, 150,000 people signed it, and a few months later, Gatorade agreed to take out that ingredient. My favorite part of the story is she went on tour with Dr. Oz, and in the green room getting ready for that show, she was there with an expert who was from the Center for Science in the Public Interest, and he said he had been fighting BVO for 10 years, and a 15-year-old girl was able to do in a few months what he had not been able to accomplish in a decade. 
he was happy it got accomplished, though. <laughs> Uh, this is Sergio and Julio, two boys who were wrongly imprisoned in Mexico. Their family had bought a car at an auction in Texas, and turns out U.S. Customs had forgotten to take out the bag of cocaine that was in the trunk of the car that they confiscated from a drug dealer. These two boys were pulled over in Mexico and imprisoned for a year, wrongly imprisoned. Their mom... Uh, Sergio's mom started a petition on change.org. 195,000 people signed it, and they were just released from prison two weeks ago. Uh, this is John Lauer, who petitioned for seasonal firefighters who fight wildfires to get health care. And this is Lakshmi Agarwal, a young woman in India who had been attacked with acid, which is unfortunately an increasingly common crime in India. She had been 15 years old and not wanted to marry the man they wanted her to marry, and she said no, and he attacked her by throwing acid on her. Uh, one in every thousand girls is now suffering this in India. So she started a petition, 28,000 people signed it. She was able to convince the government of India to regulate the sale of acid. So now it will be much, much harder to buy, which means far fewer people will suffer from that. So I have a quick video uh, that's going to just show you a few more examples of some of the things we've done over the past year, and then I will take it from there. I'd heard about change.org. That's the website where anyone can create a petition about anything that they care about. Well, the cool thing about change.org mm -hmm. is anybody can write a petition about anything. Right. It might not have happened if three New Jersey teen girls hadn't spoken up and started a petition. Tap water at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which trains more than 12,000 Marines every year, was toxic for decades. To become that careful, they know they were wrong. Everybody else knows they were wrong, too. Uh, this act alone will not bring back those who've lost, but uh, it will honor their memory by making a real difference. It's been 20 years since a woman has asked the tough questions during a presidential debate. We knew that that had to change because it's just not right that in 2012 women should still be on the sidelines and missing out from important positions like this. We are here for the second presidential debate at Town Hall. Fast food companies like McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell, they've taken it out, but the government is still feeding it to our kids. I got to see a new documentary that's coming out called Bully. The problem is they've given the movie an R rating. A petition has been started by a high school student in Michigan to change the rating. I'm proud of you. Two months ago, we started a petition asking President Obama to give seasonal wildland firefighters health insurance. But yesterday, he did just that. We started as just a, a petition, and I feel like we've grown into a whole movement. This is a tragedy. I can only imagine what these parents are going through. We thank you for all those people who went on change.org to sign a petition, not just to think about it, but to do something. I just want to speak from my heart to your heart because a heart has no color. And I want to say thank you from my heart to your heart. That video ends with Trayvon. I, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with that story. And part of the reason I think it's important to show that is because 
some of these things happen quickly, and some of them are really long road. And so Trayvon Martin's parents, you know, 2.2 million people signed that first petition to have George Zimmerman prosecuted, and they won. But that wasn't, as you know, the rest of the story. It hasn't been a complete victory for them, and so now they're going back to try to fight the stand your ground laws that are the problem that led to the whole situation. And so my point is that it's important to be there to fight for it, not just at the beginning, but through the long haul of sometimes it might take you know, many, many steps. And we saw another example this year with Boy Scouts. You know, people have been fighting to accept gay scouts into the Boy Scouts for many, many years. Um, 13 years ago, in fact, they went to the Supreme Court for their right to keep gay Boy Scouts out of the Scouts. And we saw 124 petitions together, 1.3 million signatures over a 13-month period that eventually led to the Boy Scouts, along with lots of other organizations participating, but eventually led to the Boy Scouts accepting Gay Scouts this year. And it was people understanding that every little step matters, right? So it wasn't just let's all petition the Boy Scouts and ask them to do what we think is right. It's how do we understand how change gets made. So it started with a compelling personal story of an individual who was denied his Eagle Scout Award because he was gay after all those years of putting in hard work of the Scouts. And you know, do people support that he should still get his Eagle Scout Award? Absolutely, 200,000 people signed his petition. And then people started petitioning the companies that fund the Boy Scouts and said, Intel, UPS, are you sure that you want to fund an organization that discriminates against people, and they said no, and pulled their funding. Then we asked you know, celebrities to pull out of concerts that the Boy Scouts were sponsoring, and eventually enough time, enough people led to them doing the right thing. So sometimes the fight is short, sometimes it's long, it's people just like you, and people less lucky than you who are doing these things. And it's working all over the world. This is a map of our victories from just the month of August of this year. So we literally see people winning all over the world. Some things are really big, like a lot of the ones you saw. Some are small, like people saying they want to get a street light put on their street, or they want to save a particular teacher from being fired at their school. We see everything from really small to big national campaigns. And across every cause. So this, again, is victories just from the month of August. And you can see it's across the, the whole gamut of things that matter to people. And it means that anyone can go on and use the platform for a personal story they care about, and they can mobilize others to join their cause. And as I said before, we're a business, we're a B Corp, so the way that we monetize is by working with organizations to connect them to people who are passionate about their causes. So we partner with organizations like these, and we help them find users who already have expressed interest in a cause, already have expressed the desire to take action by signing a petition, and we help them scale their users, their advocates, and their donors as well. So the main point here I want to get across is this is the beginning of a new generation of companies that are using technology for social good and that are using business for social good. And this is just the beginning. There are so many more companies to come. There will be lots of jobs like these, and you will be the ones to create them. So I can't wait to see what comes out of the minds of people like this. So I'm going to take a step back in time now and talk about how I got here. Are there any questions about change.org before? I don't want to take too many, but if there's a couple before, the rest of this is just about general life advice. Any questions? So how did I get here, and what advice do I have? So we are the product of our surroundings. These are my parents. They also happen to be sitting in the back of the room today. <laughs> Could wave. My father is accepting a big award tonight. He's receiving the Distinguished Service Alumni Award at Cornell. So I'm actually here to celebrate him. Uh, and that's him on the, on the left-hand side there practicing my handshake with me at a very young age. I think I am four years old in that picture. And I was very lucky to grow up with a dad like him. He believed in me. He told me I could do anything I wanted to do. He believed girls could do anything they wanted to do. And he taught me lots of life lessons <coughs> along the way, from very big, my favorite one being don't work with jerks. 
uh, <laughs> which turned out to be very valuable, to very small but important, like always wear your name tag on the right so that when you turn to shake someone's hand, your name is facing them instead of away from them. And the other one that's been very handy is never apologize before, at the beginning of a sentence or before you introduce an idea. Lots of people will say things like, this might be a dumb idea, but, and if you start an idea like that, no one will think it's a good idea because you already have said you don't think so. And on the right is my mother and my sister. Uh, what you can't really see very well in the picture is that I am wearing a suit in this photo. It's a camel hair suit with a blouse <laughs> that has a tie. <laughs> I, at this time, Diane Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, was at that time the mayor of San Francisco where I grew up and she used to wear these suits with the ties in the front. And so I insisted that my parents buy me a camel hair suit. I don't, how old am I in that picture? Like nine, eight? Yeah, yeah, that was, um, and I won't talk about the hair do you let me wear there, but. Um, so my mother was a great role model for me. She's also wearing a suit in this picture, as you can see. And she was a great inspiration to me because she has what I call grit. She, late, you know, in her mid-career, decided that she wanted to change careers. She went back to business school with a full-time job and two kids and completely changed her life. She, in order to get the job that she got out of business school, she interviewed 50 places before she got a job. And the job she ultimately got was at a very prominent management consulting firm where she eventually stayed 20 years and became one of their absolute most successful partners. So just showed that if you fight for it and if you stay determined, you can achieve anything you want. We are also the product of our experiences. These are my Cornell years. Apparently big hair was also popular <laughs> in the early 90s. I was a coxswain on the crew team. I am the small one in that photo, so it's easy to pick me out. I learned a lot of great leadership lessons from Cox and Crew and helping people understand how to push through pain into winning. Uh, and then I tried some crazy things in college. I tried to push myself hard, so one of the things I did was join the volunteer fire department. That's the lower left-hand photo. And the young girl I'm with there was my little sister. I, I was a big sister in college and, and worked with this young girl from Cambodia who had three younger sisters herself, so I was always traipsing around Ithaca with like four tiny Cambodian girls at the movies and things. Um, and then I taught during the summers at a program called Breakthrough, which if you haven't heard of it, is one of the most amazing summer job experiences ever for anyone interested in education or interested in leadership. I would highly recommend it. That is me doing some kind of rap, which is not most of the time, but some of the time what you do there. And then as Professor Streeter mentioned, I, my work career started in nonprofit. I founded the Pittsburgh site of what was then called Summerbridge Pittsburgh, spent about nine years at Yahoo, founded the deal map, sold it to Google, and now I'm at change.org. And we're the product of our lives. This is my family, those are my two daughters at my older daughter's bat mitzvah. Um, and I, 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 the reason I put this here is because our lives are a balance of work and family. These things fit together and I also happen to have learned a lot from my husband because he's very different than me. My husband grew up in a blue collar family in Pittsburgh with nine brothers and sisters. Neither of his parents finished high school. He put himself through college by joining the army and you know, had four jobs from the time he was in fourth grade. And so he is one determined person. And he's also really, really helpful and just a wonderful guy. So <laughs> I've learned a lot and it's made a big impact on me. So my general advice, I've got 10 pieces of advice that you can use right now while you're in school and 10 pieces of advice that will be relevant to you, I hope, when you're working. Um, and maybe these will even be relevant to people not in school. I realize there are some folks in the audience that are um, not still in school. So the top point here is the key point, which is look for the lessons. Everything in your life has something to teach you, whether it seems fun, whether it seems like a failure, whether, you know, the person sitting next to you, everything has something to teach you. I didn't really realize this at the time, but now that I look back on it, there's so many lessons in everything I did. So if I could just have been looking a little closer at the time, I might have seen them earlier and be able to use them earlier. So 
Lesson number one for me is it's all about the people. At the end of the day, every job I've ever taken, I've taken because I thought I would learn from the people there. Um, and again, people have so much to teach you, and the people who push you the hardest probably teach you the most. So the people, look for people who make you uncomfortable, who are a little bit, you know, push you harder than you think you can work, and I would suggest a lot getting to know your professors. As I say, like at the end of the day, you will all end up adults. Like this afternoon, I'm going to visit with one of my favorite professors, and at this point, like we're both just adults. We have kids and so forth. He happened to be my professor, but now he's just my friend, and your professors can be your friends also, but work hard for them. Uh, so first, since it's all about the people, first build relationships, and we talked about this a little bit earlier in the class. It will help you to start by understanding people. Before you try to debate them or disagree on a topic or get them to do what you want them to do, first understand them. The work that you're doing now to, to make friends and get to know people may seem like just fun and social stuff, but it's actually going to be really helpful for you in your lives. Do something that really challenges you. So when I was uh, in college, I was planning to go abroad to Italy to study art history, and I took two years of Italian getting ready for that, and then decided at the last minute that I could probably do something that would challenge me more, that I had this sort of rare opportunity to take a time in my life and do something I would maybe never do again. So instead of going to Italy, I chose to go to the Amazon rainforest and study Amazon rainforest ecology. It had nothing to do at all with my major. I was a psychology major. It had nothing to do with what I wanted to do in my life. I was not even really that interested in it. But I just wanted to do something hard. And it was hard, <laughs> I'll tell you. Uh, this was the house I lived in. Um, I even brought my parents there to visit this house at the end of my semester. It takes two planes, <coughs> a bus, a, and two boats to get to this house. Um, and I learned a lot. I, I think part of what I learned is about how to get an outsider's perspective. Being in someone else's shoes and understanding someone else's life made me think a lot when I came home about other people who are outsiders in the world that I live in. And part of the hardest thing I did there was learn another language. And so I, I mean this more figuratively than literally, but actually the literal work of learning another language was probably the hardest thing I have ever done in my life. How many people here speak more than one language? That is impressive. I am really impressed. Um, that's great. And what I've learned is that lots of people speak different languages, not just foreign languages, but you know the difference between business people and engineers, and the difference sometimes between men and women. There are lots of, of ways that people communicate differently. And for me, the act of actually learning another language and learning how to communicate with other people taught me, taught me a lot. So master the struggle. Any math majors in here? Or anyone who's, OK, two? Um, my kids have this amazing math teacher who says, Math is not about getting the right answer. It is about learning how to master the struggle. It's about not giving up when you can't figure out how to solve the problem. And she does things with them, like give them a calculator and say, you can use a calculator to solve this problem, but you can't use the number two. And then she makes them like figure out. It's like not, worse than not having a calculator, I think, to not have the number two. Um, but they really have to think so hard to do it. And so this is, and you'll see it again in the second 10 pieces of advice. It's just really so much of life is learning how to get up after you fall. And to that effect, I have found that it's helpful not just to fail and get up again, but actually celebrate your failures. So we've started something at my company called the Festival of Failure. And when someone makes a mistake, we have them literally like stand up and celebrate it. On our all team calls, people will say things like, in my festival of failure moment this week, I did X. And the idea is that the more you celebrate it and the more you advertise your failures, the more you and everyone else around you can learn from them. So if you keep your failures to yourselves, it means other people may make those same mistakes too. Whereas if you celebrate them, then you're preventing others from doing the same thing and they may do the same from you, for you. Who knows who this is? 
slides. Professor Studer. Yeah, Billie Jean King. She is one of the most famous uh, women's tennis players, really the leader of the women's tennis movement in general, and she is an incredible woman. She actually, there's a documentary on her on PBS that just aired a couple weeks ago that I highly recommend. Um, she talks about, she has two things she always says when she coaches people in tennis. The first is, pressure is a privilege. You only have pressure if you're already succeeding, right? So think about it that way and remember it's a privilege. The other thing she says is, champions adapt. And this is one of the skills I always look for when I hire people, is people who are good at mastering change and maneuvering through change. And she describes how when she was preparing for tennis matches, that instead of like visualizing herself winning the game, she would visualize all the things that could happen that would be out of her control and might go wrong. So she'd think about things like, what if it's really windy? Or what if I get a particularly bad line call? And she would visualize how she might react to those things and the different outcomes based on how she reacted. And so when, by the time she got to the game, she was totally prepared and could adapt to most of the situations. And that's why she says she thinks she was so successful at tennis. Not because she had a great serve, but because she was totally prepared for every game. She said 75% of the time, you're not hitting the ball. So this is about understanding your talent. Um, I went, I had a career epiphany in the middle of my career where I was, I had been at Yahoo for about five years. I had spent that whole time in marketing. I was at that point running marketing for about two thirds of the company and I was next in line to be the CMO of, of Yahoo. And I was sitting at a sales conference one day and the speaker put up this chart on the, you know, on the, on the screen. And I looked at this chart, he described it. Talent are the things that you're naturally good at, that you've been good at since you were a child, that are innate to you, that come really naturally. And skills are the things you get to be good at over time because you learn how to do them. And people who are the most successful and the happiest in their jobs are in this upper right quadrant. So from my perspective, the secret to your entire career is understanding what's on your X axis. So when he asked this question that day, how many of you are in the job you always know you've wanted to have? Like every hand in the room shot up. All the people were in sales and they'd all been like selling t-shirts when they were small and just selling things for their lives. And our chief marketing officer was right in front of me and her hand shot up. And I had this moment where I realized I didn't want her job. And I realized I was doing something that I had gotten to be good at, but I, it wasn't my natural talent and it wasn't my love. I was in this upper left quadrant, which is kind of not a super happy place to be. I was satisfied, but I wasn't really happy. And so I thought about what my talent was, and I thought about back to things like coxing and teaching, and realized that my talent was more about inspiring people and coaching teams and getting people to win together and I realized that I wanted to be running a business rather than operating within one function of a business. And there was one job at Yahoo Open that was a general management job that looked like that. So I went to apply for it. It was the job running Yahoo Autos. I knew nothing about cars. Um, I learned way more about cars than I ever thought I would. <laughs> and I got that job. It was two levels below the job I already had in marketing and they wanted me to take a two-level demotion and a cut in equity and title to take this job. And I said, that's crazy, why would I do that? Why would you do that to a senior leader at your company? And they said, well, it's not fair to other people and so forth. So we negotiated and we, I ended up taking a one-level demotion to take that job, um, which was really painful, but I did it anyway because I wanted to see if this was going to be my talent and the thing I loved. And that was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had in my career. I had 30 people on that team. We were able to launch new products. We tripled the revenue of that business in 18 months. And then they promoted me back to the level I had been before and asked me to run five more businesses at Yahoo. Because it turns out I actually was pretty good at that. I just had to prove myself first. So finding your talent, it, that was a complete change in trajectory for my whole career. I took a risk to do it, but it set the rest of my career on a different path. And as early as you can find that, the better off you'll be. So 
there's lots of different things that go in this bucket. I was telling a story that the other day my, um, my younger daughter, Rachel, said to me, Mom, I want to be famous. I was like, okay, you know, what would, what would you like to be famous for? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, you could win the Nobel Prize. That would make you famous. <laughs> and she said, I said, well, what are you good at? And she said, well, I'm good at resolving conflicts between my friends. And I'm good at making people feel better when they're sad. You know, to me, that was extremely insightful for an 11-year-old. She might have been 10 when she told me this. And that, she's right. That is her talent. Like, she already knows at age 10 what she's good at. And there are plenty of jobs out there that will take advantage of that exact talent. So we started talking about what does it mean if you're good at resolving conflicts between people. You could be a psychiatrist. You could be an executive coach. You could be, I mean, there's so many jobs. And so finding what that is is going to be critical. I've spent more time on this slide because I feel really passionately about this. If you don't know what your talent is, go back and ask your parents what you were like as a kid. I don't know what I was like as a kid, but <laughs> we can talk about that later. Number nine is about learning how to tell your story. And I think this is, you know, again, lots of you will be headed out to interviews for jobs, and it's all about how you package your story. And people care way less about your GPA and, you know, the exact courses you took than they care about the things you've done, the challenges you've overcome, the risks you've taken. How do you put your story together into something that sounds compelling and that you're confident to tell? And if you're early and you don't, you know, if you're early in school and you don't feel like you have a great story yet, then go out and do a bunch of things that will make you have a great story. There's still time. And number 10 is believe in yourself. At the end of the day, the people who walk into that room to interview who believe in themselves are the ones who get the jobs. It doesn't matter exactly, as I said, what you've done or what your GPA is. You need to be confident that you can do that job. You need to express that confidence. And I think, I say there's a, fi a very fine line between confidence and arrogance. Um, but most students don't ever get anywhere close to arrogance. They are so far below on the confidence meter that, and I think they sometimes feel nervous that if they appear too confident, it will come off as arrogant. I don't think that's true. You could try some prep mock interviewing with people, but generally, you know, pushing yourself a little bit beyond your comfort zone and expressing how confident you are you can do something will be a good thing. Okay, top 10 for once you start working, and I'll go through these maybe a bit quicker so that we have time for questions. Number one is about doing worthwhile work. And it doesn't matter, you know, it's your definition of worthwhile. It does not have to be that you go work for a nonprofit or that you, you know, move to a developing country. Whatever you want to do that feels worthwhile to you. As I talk to people in their careers over time and ask them what motivates them, they all say they want to do something they feel is important. There is a squirrel in this picture because of a great book called Gung Ho, which I recommend you read by another Cornellian named Ken Blanchard, who the book talks about what we can learn from animals. And squirrels are intently focused on the, their work of gathering nuts because they know how important it is and that they won't survive for the winter without it. So anyway, worthwhile work. Number two, add value wherever you can. And this is the approach. I literally use this motto at work. I will be like, who has the mower? If you have the mower, mow the lawn. Like, there are so many things to do in, in whatever job you're going to take. Step beyond what you've been asked to do and add value wherever you can. These are the people who are the most successful at their work, the most, success, the most likely to become leaders, to get promoted, et cetera. They step beyond what they're asked to do, and they help others around them get what they need to get done. I get asked a lot, how do I get a seat at the table? This is a question I used to get all the time from marketers, like marketing doesn't have a seat at the table. And at first, I would say, just sit at the table. Like, you don't really need to be invited. You just need to show up. Um, but then the more I thought about it, I realized that you can't just show up. You actually, the way to get invited is to have an idea. So if you see something that can be done, come up with an idea, bring it to people, champion something, that will get you a seat at the table. 
and you want to be the solutions person. Creative ideas, wherever they may come from, are always welcomed in work environments. What's not welcomed is complaining about problems. So <laughs> I have a rule at my office that people can bring me any problem they want. They can, any problem, I don't care how big or small, as long as they bring me at least three ideas of how to solve it. And they could be horrible ideas, but if they walk in the room with three potential ideas, then all of a sudden it's our problem. We can go into solution mode together. Whereas if all they do is complain about a problem, then as the person receiving the problem, it puts you in a position of extreme discomfort. So one example I was telling Professor Streeter about, I had a young woman in my office the other day who said she didn't think we were doing as good a job as we could onboarding new employees when they got hired. And instead of just coming to my office and saying that, she said that, and then she said, so I was thinking about it, and I made a couple sample presentations that I thought might be good when we <coughs> hire people. And I started like testing them with new employees when they started just to see if they'd be any good. And it was like heaven to me, right? Because she had a problem, she had already gone halfway to solving it. So at that point, all I had to do was help make her idea better. And it didn't, you know, it didn't cause me pain the way lots of people coming with problems do. This picture, I think, was taken somewhere near where my husband grew up. <laughs> 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 um, this is called Bring the Woof. So how many dog owners in the room? Any dog owners? So I love this sign because if that sign just stopped at the top, no one would read that sign. It just says what every other sign says. But when they put the bottom part on this sign, not only do people read it, they literally take pictures and post it on Instagram and Flickr and share it with their friends. And it's a sign that's telling you to pick up your dog poop. And they're literally sharing it on, on the web. And the reason they do is because it's so creative. The person who wrote this clearly understands dog owners and what motivates them. And it's just hysterical. It's so funny that your dog would be watching and paying attention to the sign. And so for me, this signals creativity, right? It's about not just doing what you're asked to do, but taking it that one little step further to just make it a little bit better, a little bit more creative, a little more original. <coughs> That's what's going to get you noticed at work. It may take more time, and it's worth it. Um, you want to be competitive. You know, work in many cases is about winning. You've got competitors. You want to beat them. That's good. It's good to have a little fire in the belly, or maybe a lot of fire in the belly. Um, I believe it's possible to be competitive and also still be nice. So. That when I was in business school, I had a professor who used to call me swim with the dolphins, Dolsky. And he told me all the time I was too nice. And that I would never be successful because I was too nice. And I debated him quite a bit. And then at the end of the semester, we did this simulation, you know, where all the teams competed against each other in running this business. And he said, you're not going to win. You need to be more like a shark. And of course, my team won. <laughs> but <laughs> it is possible. The thing about competition is that later in life, your competition often turns out to be your partner or your acquirer, or they quit their company and come to your company, or vice versa. And so it just never pays to be mean to people. This is you know back to the don't work with jerks. You don't want to be the jerk. And you can still kick someone's you know what and be nice about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, work hard. This is an old picture. You'd probably have your phone on the toilet at this point. But um, you should work hard. I think part of being successful, especially early on, is putting in the extra effort and really working hard. But you need to preserve some time for your own life. And especially in this day and age, I was saying it's shocking to me how many people are on their phones, like walking everywhere. Um, because when I was at Cornell, we didn't have cell phones, so nobody was on their phone ever. Um, yeah, just separate and don't work too, too hard. Eight is about building a succession plan. If you want to move forward in your career, make sure there is someone behind you. You know, when you say to your manager, I want to take the next role, or I, I'm leaving this company to go to some other company, 
the best way to do that is always to have a plan for how to fill your own spot. So it's, you know, it becomes even more important later in your career, but even early on, if you want to move to the next thing, make sure there's someone who knows how to do your job so that you're not leaving someone with a giant hole. It's really hard to be the manager and have the person lead with a big hole, and so the best way to keep those relationships is to have a plan to, for how to do your work when you stop doing it. So this is how I describe entrepreneurship, what it's like to be an entrepreneur. It's also true of leadership in general. I say it's kind of like climbing a mountain. Some days it's super sunny and I'm halfway up and I brought a picnic lunch and I can see the top and I know I'm going to get there and it's awesome. And then other days it's stormy and dark and I'm at the bottom and I brought a backpack that's like 50 times my body weight. And you know, think, of, think about the days when your competitor launches something that you think is better than yours, or you know, somebody really important leaves your company to go somewhere else. There are just all these days that really feel super stressful. And the thing about great leaders is that they just keep going. Like, both days you have to go up the mountain. You, you know, you just keep going, and you have to inspire other people to come with you. So you not only have to keep going up, you have to believe you can still reach the top, even on the days it seems really hard. And the last piece is about keeping it all in perspective. This is another, this is a, um, a little note that also Rachel, my younger one, wrote on our company whiteboard when she was about seven. It says, you're the best company in the world and the most entertaining. And don't erase this until everybody <laughs> sees it. And you know, this is the one who says she's good at lifting people's spirits when they feel down. And boy, was she right. Even at seven, she wrote this note. And she made everybody come over and sign it. I don't even think we were necessarily having a bad day. But that's you know, what she did. And we kept this up on the whiteboard until we sold the company. It was there for years on the whiteboard to keep it in perspective for us. That life is not just about work. At the end of the day, our lives are bigger than work and work can and should be a big part of it, but you have to enjoy the other things in life too and remember that you know, some things are big and some are small and you need to appreciate all that's there. And that's it. Yeah, so I suppose I really started my career in a social cause, right? So I, when I graduated, I started this nonprofit and was a teacher. And I think even when I look back earlier in my life, I did a lot of things that were about helping other people's lives get better. So in high school, for instance, I tutored English as a second language at a high school where people were brand new immigrants. And I taught art classes for little kids and so forth. I just always felt like I wanted to do something that made the world better. Um, I think what happened, the reason I sort of stepped away from that perhaps for a while is because um, I also had a real passion for technology and I had a core belief inside me that the way to scale impact was through technology. So it's taken me sort of 15 years to put the pieces back together, but I'm finally now able to do something impactful at scale. And that's what I've been aiming for. Um, and I, I don't know how I want to say that I think just sense, but this is an interesting question because when you brought up build a succession plan for number eight, it struck me that when you build a succession plan, you have somebody else coming in. Um, and to me, that sounded almost like if you're looking for a job and you don't have a foot in the door, you're not in a good position. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the way I would think about it is that there's the jobs that the company has today, and then there's the jobs they're hiring for in the future. And so what I'm talking about is the exact role you happen to be sitting in today. Like the company could have 25 open jobs that no one in the company could do, 
but the, the job that they already have filled, you want to try to help them have a solution for. And it might even be finding a friend who doesn't work at the company who you're ready to hire and bring in when that person, when you leave into the other position. So it doesn't have to come from inside the company. Just have a plan, even if it's a short-term plan that says these three people will take my work for the next three months and I'll help hire my backfill, that would be fine too. Sure. I think this is a good time for us to move to over to the reception and you'll have a chance to, to, to ask uh, some questions of Jenna outside. So one more time, let's thank her for a great presentation.